And welcome back, Blogging Heads viewers, to another episode of Foreign Entanglements, where we talk about pressing international affairs issues of the day. Today, I'm pleased to introduce my guest, Dr. Anna Poles. She's currently Senior Lecturer in Security Studies at Massey University in Wellington, New Zealand. Anna, welcome. Thank you very much, Natalie. Anna, you've got a very strong interest in many security areas, among them including the Pacific Islands, uh, peace and conflict studies, peacekeeping and gender. Uh, I'd like you to just introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and your interest in security studies. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, starting with my, my interest really stemmed from the fact that I, I grew up in the Asia um, in Asia and the Pacific as a consequence of parents and the New Zealand diplomatic service. So international relations was always very much part of, of my childhood and and really informed and influenced um, my interest as I went into university. And I always knew I wanted to work in this region and I was particularly concerned about why things were happening and and um, and the need to ensure that different uh, voices and perspectives are represented um, beyond the, the norm and the conventional conventional thinking around issues. So I, I um, came from that perspective of uh, having grown up in a region where when I arrived at university um, to do um, my undergraduate degree and, sub and later a PhD at, uh, in Canberra, ANU, I found that the different voices um, from the region weren't actually represented in a lot of the readings and, and so forth that I was given. And I was acutely aware of this, and this really uh, drove me to um, focus much of my work from my master's onwards um, very much on on looking at different perspectives and, and bringing those different perspectives forward uh, to the more sort of conventional debates around peacekeeping, stabilisation, um, peace and conflict and so forth. Sure. And I suppose for Australians like myself um, and, and yourself and for Kiwis, it's quite common for us to think of the region. Um, just for our mostly American audience, uh, what do we define as our region? Well, I think that I think that probably depends where you're sitting, actually. So our region, well, from our perspective down here, would very much be the Pacific, but um, that is you know, an enormous, expansive place, and uh, and within that, it's important to recognise that it's by no means homogenous. It's very different um, depending on where you're where you're sitting in the Pacific. If it might be in Samoa or Papua New Guinea or in the Northern Pacific. And you did your Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, you did your doctoral research on Solomon Islands. Is that right? Uh, I did my my PhD on the relationship and the, and the dynamics between peacekeepers and local populations in Timor and the Solomons. Um, and my particular interest, again, was looking at how you can uh, ex uh, gauge mission success and mission legitimacy and sustainable peace through that critical relationship between local populations and and uh, peacekeepers. So much of the focus is always on the elite, the national elite and so forth. Um, but ultimately, it's that local population at the village level, grassroots level, who will determine um, the sustainability of, of that peace. And I'd like to return to peacekeeping actually in the Pacific as well, but just to broaden it out a little bit, since we're talking about countries in the, in the Pacific areas, we're talking about Papua New Guinea, Solomons, Timor, so on and so forth, I would just like to give our audience an idea of actually why this this particular region is of greater strategic interest and greater international affairs interest. Um, you've seen a lot of Chinese money come down into the region in the form mm -hmm. of develop assistance and loans and so forth. Um, What's the potential there for strategic competition and how significant is this part of the world? Well, I'm pretty biased, um, but I think this part of the world is actually uh, fairly significant from a geopolitical and geostrategic perspective. There's no doubt that, uh, and particularly in two theatres in the Pacific, Western Pacific um, and the South Pacific, that there's growing geostrategic competition. And this is about two things. It's about influence and it's about resource security. Um, and particularly both uh, fisheries security, um, fishery, um, fish stocks, and uh, deep sea mineral mining, which is the, the going to be the next big, big thing. Um, and without a doubt, we're seeing increased interest in both in both of those. There's strong competition around resource security, uh, and there's grow going to be growing competition. Uh, around deep sea mineral mining. Now, this has geopolitical ramifications, obviously, because we've already seen the Pacific has always been uh, contested by different, what I refer to as periphery powers, like China, um, Russia, the US, 
and Japan, Taiwan, the Korea, and other deep water fishing nations, also European um, fishing nations like like Spain and, and others. So the Pacific has always been um, contested by by these periphery, by these external powers, but that contest is, in, in my view, is, uh, that competition is going to increase as fish stocks run low, as there's a need to find other um, sources of, um, of energy and, and so forth, um, minerals, and, and, and this is simply going to keep increasing. I mean, we're looking at, for example, in the Western Pacific in 2048, um, where the fish stocks are predicted to be depleted, um, there is increasing talk around uh, by the deep water fishing nations for the need f- for vessels to be provided with military escorts as competition increases and so forth. Um, and then there's the other aspect too. There's the fact that, for example, uh, from a Chinese perspective, the Western Pacific, the islands of the Western Pacific, which include America, the American um, Pacific um, regions around federated sites of Micronesia, Palau, Guam, etc., they fall into what uh, what's referred to in the Chinese um, military lexicon as the second island's chain, mm-hmm. um, which is part of the 1980s of Admiral Liu's um, projection, his na- naval strategy, um, where China would control the first, second, and third island chains by 2048. Sorry, by 2020, 2040. Um, and so you're going to see increased interest in in claiming. Geostrategic uh, influence over these regions, and particularly if there's a stronger push towards maritime power, and Russia has also demonstrated that it is increasingly testing testing the waters in the region as well, both in the air by um, by its frequent incursions uh, into Guam, into American airspace over Guam, um, and also by its redeployment of um, submarines. Um, into the Pacific Ocean. So again, we see this increasing contest over influence and control of access as well, which is very important. So, I mean, some of that competition is obviously between the periphery powers themselves. Mm. Can you speak to perhaps the capabilities of countries in the region to be able to resist or to, to deal with that kind of strategic competition? And is there a role for countries like Australia and New Zealand? Absolutely. I mean, there's absolutely a role because... It's imperative that the resources um, and that the uh, stability of the Pacific Island countries are not impacted by the strategic competition. And obviously they, they, uh, they have been in the past and they will be in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you have states uh, which um, are already struggling as a consequence of, of internal factors, whether it be um, whether it be corruption or the impact of climate change and El Nino, and that's only going to worsen in the Pacific um, over the coming years, um, the unemployment, all those other factors which, which create stresses on, on a country, um, particularly on a country which does not have a large budget to respond to those stresses, uh, it's inevitable that they can become caught up in in, in these um, in these geopolitical games by by the larger powers. In my view, Australia and New Zealand have a direct responsibility to actually ensure that these countries um, are not um, unfairly taken um, taken advantage of. And that's not to suggest that mm-hmm. that Pacific Island countries don't have agency because they do and and very capable of of, of navigating these waters. Um, but as we know, some, the power imbalances are such um, that that sometimes it's it's not easy. And New Zealand and Australia have been guilty of, of that as well. I mean, one only has to consider the the um, offshore detention centres um, that Australia runs to to acknowledge the fact that both Australia and New Zealand do use their the power imbalance to their favour. And that's one of the debates around the Pacific, the future of the Pacific Islands Forum. Sure. Um, certainly. So. I would like to see both Australia and New Zealand taking a very, very proactive role around climate change, around deep sea mineral mining, around um, resource protection, and and both countries do are very, very um, engaged in this issue because we have a vested interest in this part of the world. Actually, I was going to ask a provocative question. I mean, are we living up to that responsibility? You suggest at the end we do, but I mean, to what extent do you think that's satisfactory? Well, certainly in regards to climate change, um, there is strong criticism throughout the region that Australia and New Zealand are not actually living up to their obligations um, and their commitments. So I think, uh, yes, to a degree, but 
uh, both countries uh, could do much more actually to listen to what Pacific Island countries want, to what their needs and priorities are, rather than this this the classic um, dare I say neocolonialistic approach that that both countries have taken towards the region. Uh, it's very much about time to um, to move aside and 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 support Pacific Island countries to be in the driver's seat of the region of what happens to their their countries because ultimately it impacts them and their populations um, much more so than it does for Australia and New Zealand. Fair enough. I mean, looking at other kinds of areas where Australia has taken up its responsibility and New Zealand as well, I would just like to talk a little bit about the case of East the case of East Timor. Mm. And, and so for our listeners, if you can just give them a quick shakedown of the events surrounding 1999 and the UN-led mm. peacekeeping mission there, and then I'd like for us to talk a little bit about what we learned from that experience. Okay. Well, very um, very briefly, uh, as, as your listeners will be aware, in 1975, in an Indonesia invaded uh, Timor, um, and in 1999, a um, UN, the Indonesian government agreed to a UN-sponsored referendum on whether Timor would would remain with Indonesia or pursue independence. And Australia um, and New Zealand played a really critical role at that time uh, to support to support that process. Australia Australia particularly led um, interfer- the international force that went into Timor. Um, yeah, uh, following the the referendum, um, and the UN obviously played a critical role um, enabling that referendum to take place. So, uh, so both countries, both Australia and New Zealand, have been very much engaged in Timor um, since ninety nine, particularly, but certainly, um, but also beforehand um, as well. But in terms of supporting Timor's independence, both countries have been very much. Very much um, of uh, of a view that this is this is a responsibility, um, perhaps to right some wrongs. Actually, um, having not done anything previous to to nineteen ninety nine, um, given relations with with Indonesia, so there are some important lessons that come out of the Timor experience um, for both Australia and New Zealand, and also for for other countries that were involved. It was a you know, multinational um, UN force that that, that ultimately uh, went in, and certainly in two thousand and six. Um, and there are some significant lessons around, uh, and probably the most the most important ones around actually, um, both in terms of understanding the context that you're going to, but ensuring that there's local buy-in, local ownership of of the processes that take place. And these, this is particularly relevant to um, to 2006, but even going back to 1999 and the establishment of of Antiet and the success of UN missions, state building missions that were established following the referendum for independence. Um, and again, one of the things that we found out in those early years and in, um, in the 2000s was the fact that that it was very much UN driven and there's been considerable um, criticism about the fact that the UN um, mission did not did not sufficiently engage with with the local population in terms of particularly capacity building. And this, when Australia and New Zealand went into the Solomon Islands with Ramsey, the regional um, assistance mission to the Solomon Islands in 2003, many of those issues were at the forefront of people's minds in Canberra and Wellington of not replicating that, of ensuring that there was much more emphasis on capacity building of, of local skills um, to, ensure, to improve, ensure and to prevent what happened in many cases in in Timor where you had ministries where 75% of of um, bureaucrats were were UN officials. You spent and a lot of was, time in Timor, didn't you? Yes, I did. You did <laughs> I actually. Was there. What was I was it? there for eight years. For the time that you spent there, mm. and the people that you spoke to, what were their impressions of the Australian and New Zealand commitment to peacekeeping and the UN mission there? Um, that's a really good question because it changed over time. When I arrived in two thousand six, uh, when the crisis occurred, and I was. Um, so just to recap, there was another crisis in 2006. Just, yes, yes. Yep. So in 1999, um, the tension was between the Timorese and, and the Indonesians and the departing Indonesian forces and militias. Um, 2006 occurred and, and what happened, as so often happens in these contexts, all the, the, um, the local tensions and, and dynamics that had been frozen by a period of, 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 um, of intervention or... In, the, in, in this case, occupation, 24 years of occupation, all those 
local dynamics and political competition and, and tensions arose after mm-hmm. after independence. Um, and they date back the, back to 1974 and earlier, the, the power struggles that were going on um, internally within Timor. So this emerged in 2006. And so the Australian-led International um, Stabilisation Force came back into, into Timor. Interestingly enough, about four days before the crisis happened, the UN was actually packing up shop. Um, and they were saying, yeah, Timor was a success. Timor was the poster child of international state building. It was one of the first new states in the new century. Uh, and therefore everything was a success. Um, and yet for years, for probably since around 2003, 2004, trouble had been brewing. And in 2006, uh, it exploded again. Um, um, and it was extremely, um, extremely, uh, Difficult time with tensions between military and the police. There was um, there was identity politics um, used to the very worst, where you had people from the east and west um, uh, in conflict with each other and pushing pushing um, easterners out of the out of the capital and so forth. So it was so again, Australia and New Zealand came back in, and I arrived at this point to work with the Timorese government, and. Um, it was very clear to me at those early days that the perception of Australia and New Zealand uh, was very much of their of um, of being f- of friends of, of coming back in to to support Timor because of what they had done in ninety nine and supporting Timor towards independence. What happened, unfortunately, was was um, Australia and New Zealand because they miss in my view, mismanaged a lot of that early entry into Timor in 2006. They didn't necessarily understand the dynamics were very different um, and that it was actually far more complex in, in many ways because they were dealing with very different factions. It wasn't a, a homogenous sort of Timorese um, fa- um, group that they were dealing with. And, and during those early days in 2006, the Timorese, uh, the Australians, sorry, did a number of things which actually um, impacted their uh, local perceptions of of Timorese, um, of Australians, sorry, and they also fell victim to to uh, the Portuguese doing some destabilising and uh, to shifting perce- shifting perceptions um, around around Australians, and so there was a very strong sort of um, anti Australian uh, propaganda being pushed by the Portuguese during that time, which could have probably been handled a bit better by the Australians, actually. By the Portuguese, so, wow. Um, yes, yes. Um, so, so that was so that was a very sort of there was a very sort of you know there was a power struggle going on as well um, during during two thousand and six. So and th- so this was this probably impact this did impact the way Australians Australians and New Zealanders were were perceived. And there was also and this is inevitable too when you've had a country which has experienced so much. Um, International intervention. They've experienced um, years of of the UN being there um, and everything that that um, that means in terms of the you know dual economies, um, uh, the cost of of living being pushed up, access to housing, food costs being pushed up, all those kind of impacts, as well as the positives, you know, the employment and so forth too. But it impacted. It people become tired and they become weary and a little bit and more critical and. It's that that critical point, that critical period where international, um, where interveners need to be much more engaged with local populations. And what happened particularly in 2006 was that the UN and the international forces were not necessarily going outside Delhi. They weren't going outside the capital. They weren't necessarily going outside the large towns. And 80% of Timor's population um, you know, lives in the rural areas. And so people didn't really know. Um, the interveners weren't necessarily engaging with the local populations. Um, and vice versa. And that impacted on people's perceptions as well. That's an interesting question. Now, was that because of political reasons? Was that due to force protection reasons? Was that due to just lack of planning or lack of awareness? What do you think? I think it was a combination of all those factors, actually. Um, force protection, certainly from a UN perspective, during the periods where there was violence outside of outside of Delhi, um, there was a reluctance to um, where people were prevented from travelling out. Usual usual restrictions, um, UN restrictions on that. Um, certainly, you know, and and but there were pocket, there were um, areas where where both the Australians, New Zealanders, Portuguese, Malaysians, and other um, contingents were were located, uh, but it was. Um, this probably could have been done much more. There could be much more focus on that 
degree of engagement and even community engagement in Delhi itself uh, would have been could have been handled much better. And this is where probably the difference between between New Zealand and Australia um, was most significant. And I think this is as a consequence, and this is my view, um, as a consequence of of Australian deployments. Excuse me, between. Between 1999 and 2006, experiences in in Iraq and elsewhere, um, force protection increased significantly, and there were there were numerous times where the degrees of force protection actually impacted on the ability of the forces to protect civilians, and so this also impacted on perceptions of legitimacy and credibility on the part of the local population. Um, there were numerous issues around. The, the slow speed with this, with the, with which the UN deployed in 2006, for example, we didn't have the full police contingent and for and for a good six months, and so and there were logistics pro, logistical problems as a consequence of that. Mm-hmm. So you had, you know, I remember one occasion particularly where we ran into an ambush and um, uh, in in the capital, and a uh, Australian federal police officer drove past but was uh, unable to stop because he. Um, was on his own, and he um, and didn't have uh, the, the logistics had been so slow, um, and so he was he was unable to actually stop. And this happened repeatedly, where where warehouses with rice were being were being burnt, or houses were being burnt, but there was a lack of clarity around. Um, certainly, from the local population's perspective, around what what the Australian New Zealand's mandate was, um, mm. and also um, force protection issues as well, which which prevented which prevented uh, the Australia and New Zealand being able to um, engage uh, where perhaps they should. There were also examples of where they did engage mm. and went above and beyond too. Um, so I think it's important to to know too. I think it's probably a good point to actually raise the co-editor volume that you've been involved with. Um, Anna, you've a co-editor for this book called mm-hmm. The United Nations Peacekeeping Challenge, uh, The Importance of the Integrated Approach. It's published currently by Ashgate. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's got some very interesting uh, chapters and sections in there which talk about the range of peacekeeping, not only from the intervening country's perspective, mm-hmm. but also from the peacekeeping forces' perspective. Um, you were talking just now about force protection and protection of civilians and so on and so forth. In the book, uh, you know, could we talk a little bit about what we've learned and where we've done that better in global peacekeeping operations? Where we've done force protection and protection of civilians better. I mean, have we learnt from Timor, specifically that, that the Timorese case since then, what, what does the scorecard look like so far? Well, I think, I mean, it's, Timor was it was a I don't think you can compare Timor perhaps to um, examples in in Africa um, and you know, South Sudan um, and and other examples where where there has been you know, enormous, such enormous um, human tragedy certainly can't compare to um, Timor in two thousand six to that but I think there are some significant lessons certainly around the need for technology um, to support missions to be able to actually protect civilians. Um, one one of the areas that Emira Haq, um, the former um, Under Secretary General for Field Operations, talks about in her chapter in the book is the need for um, for better te- technology, um, better access to um, to assets like helicopters, um, the use of UAVs, for instance, um, to provide both both better protection for peacekeepers as they're increasingly targeted, but also protection of civilians as well. And that means, and this is, this has come out in the, in the, in the review and, and debates around peacekeeping that have occurred over the past six months. And we saw the, the, um, the school board up at, up at the UN as, as countries committed different, um, different things, different assets or, or, or money or, um, units and so forth to, to peacekeeping. We saw, you know, there's definitely this recognition that, that troop contributing countries need, um, better support, assets, logistics, um, financial support, you know, resources, personnel. Whether or not countries actually front up and and provide those, um, meet those commitments that they've made, I think you know, only time will tell. But there's no doubt about it. You're asking people to go into um, often horrific situations with very little support. We saw this in Timor, um, and we see that on a on a grander scale um, in countries in in, in Africa. South Sudan, elsewhere, uh, where 
the support simply hasn't been given. And you know, the classic example of, of this is Rwanda in 1994. And Romeo Dallaire wrote about this in his book, Shake Hands with the Devil. Um, and the question is, you know, have we learned anything from 1994 in Rwanda in terms of what peacekeepers need to actually do the job and, pre and prevent um, prevent the, the tragedies that have and genocides that have occurred? Um, and the answer to that, I think, is we may we may understand the lesson um, intellectually, but whether or not we're actually willing to to put our money where our our mouths are is, an, is another is another question. And, mm. Fair enough. I mean, I, I, it's an interesting this question of are we providing them with enough? Because the, of course, your book deals with an, an issue, an area that hasn't been dealt with very much, which is the duty mm. of care to peacekeepers. Yeah. Why is it that you decided to include this particular area, duty of care to peacekeepers serving um, and those who are exposed mm. to tragedy? We included this. The book actually, the, the origins of the book was, was the Pacific Army Chiefs um, and Army Management um, seminar in 2000. And, 2013, it was held in Auckland. It was a joint U.S. Army, New Zealand Army um, a conference. And for the first time, duty of care was actually put on the table um, to be discussed. And this was as, this was very much as a result of the New Zealand Army pushing this um, as an issue that we need to talk about. Because uh, it's, it's not just peacekeepers, it's soldiers. I mean, we see the um, the enormous tragedy with, with returning um, uh, soldiers and veterans in the U.S., um, which has been highly publicised, and the we felt very strongly that it was a, a critical issue that needs to be talked about, needs to be discussed, and um, and often it's very hard for for peacekeepers and soldiers and those involved in these situations to be able to come forward. So we very much felt there was a responsibility to include this this work and and to talk about the the great work that's being done um, by academics by and by practitioners around this issue. Um, we were fortunate to have a, a chapter by, by uh, the Australian General John Cantwell talking about his very um, personal experiences dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's a number of other um, chapters there which deal with this issue and look at how it's being dealt with in Australia, New Zealand, um, in the US and, and elsewhere. Um, without doubt, you know, we... And this is a question which which comes up all the time. We expect a great deal of these with these men and women, and and I include you know not just those in uniform, but also others, um, others also civilians who are in these situations too. You know, we expect a great deal from them, but don't necessarily give them the kind of support that people need when you come back from from working in countries like this, um, where these where they where they see these uh, where they bear witness to you know some of the the worst tragedies of, um, uh, um, that we've seen in, in modern times. And, and for that reason, we need to actually give them the support um, and, and understand and appreciate uh, the psychological and impact of that, that this kind of work, this very important work actually has on, or has on men and women. I mean, the Australian military is starting to recognise that more mm -hmm. and more. What is the yes. case over in New Zealand right now with regards to uh, providing adequate care after conflict? Mm. Well, it's certainly, it's more certainly being done, and uh, but it's still a slow road. There's a, there's a lot of um, sort of institutional cultural reasons why, um, why this is uh, slow to deal with. Um, without a doubt, um, the conversation is, is happening, and that's, that, that in itself is a breakthrough. Um, but certainly, my my colleagues and the contributors who talk, who write about um, New Zealand in this in this book, are very conscious in the work that they're doing. That more still needs to be done to actually to recognise early signs, to deal with the issues, to ensure that that soldiers, um, that young women and men are, are not um, being sent back into um, into theatres when when they're showing the early signs. That more needs to be done when when people when people return. Uh, we're slowly getting there, but still a lot does need to be done I mean, to provide the support to the families as well. Sure. I mean, one of the reasons I bring this up is that uh, New Zealand is obviously one of the countries that are providing uh, troops and advisors to the commitment mm. against ISIS, ISIS, Islamic State, whatever you want to call it, mm. in Iraq at the moment. And uh, I know that you had written on the Lowy Institute's blog, The Interpreter, talking mm. about a lack of clarity, a lack of mission, a lack of status for these forces. Mm. Let's just explore that a little bit. So if we are sending Kiwi troops back, and obviously Australia is sending troops um, at the moment as advisors as well, can mm. you talk a little bit about what New Zealand's commitment is there right now 
Well, it's it's similar to um it's similar to Australia's commitment in relation to the the building partner um capacity uh, program, and so non combat um obviously um and uh, working with the Australians and with other um with other uh, countries to build the capacity of the Iraqi security forces um now. The New Zealand Prime Minister John Key has given us sort of a, a two year, um, two year window on, on that commitment. Uh, I think it raises, in, in my view, it raises a lot of questions. I mean, it's, it's probably the, um, the least, um, the least contribution and the smallest contribution that New Zealand could possibly make, um, uh, whilst making a contribution, um, at the same uh, stretch. Um, how effective that's going to be. My questions have been around, well, have been around the question of effectiveness of security sector development, of training. How do you, how do you measure effectiveness? How do you judge it? How do you, um, how do you ensure that your training is sustainable? And none of this occurs in a vacuum, as you know. Um, the security sector reform and any kind of training of security forces doesn't occur in a vacuum. And there's been enormous amount of literature and reports around why it never hasn't worked so far in Iraq, um, why the US haven't haven't worked, um, why their efforts have have not worked. The emphasis. Um, the New Zealand niche has been very much around, well, this is all about local ownership and local partnership. And that's absolutely commendable. Um, but whether or not, but that takes longer than two years. And is New Zealand willing to commit to, to longer than two years? Mm. And is the New Zealand electorate willing to commit? And is there going to be any kind of mission creep? And that's what everybody is concerned about is that, in, that there will be the, that inevitable mission creep. Actually, and that so, was going to be one of my questions. I mean, yeah. you know, when, when countries are going into places like Iraq, they don't often think, well, I mean, you know, if I'm looking just from the perspective of the United States, looking for coalition partners, I think it would be good for us to know what the, what the public opinion is in, in New Zealand. What was public opinion mm. like at the time that John Key announced that New Zealand would be sending mm. troops? Um, there was a strong resistance to this. And, and why, why was that? Uh, concerns over over what New Zealand would actually be doing, what the troops would be being asked to do, uh, whether or not New Zealand should be involved in this, um, the fact that lessons from previous interventions uh, hadn't necessarily been heeded and uh, and things didn't really. New Zealand had been opposed to um, to the was never part of the original sort of coalition into into Iraq. Um, in fact, it's you know publicly being referred to as as an invasion. Um, so there's, there was a strong sense of, well, what are we doing there? How are we going to contribute? How are we going to make a difference? Um, is this even the best approach? Uh, can New Zealand afford to be doing this? So there was a lot of questions around this, um, around whether or not, should, whether or not New Zealand should actually even be there. For, and there were others, of course, there was on the, on the, um, other side of the, the debate was, well, we need to do something. Um, there, we don't have a large defence force. So, what can we do? What and New Zealand um, is very good at engaging with militaries of, of different um, uh, different uh, backgrounds, um, whether that be ethnic, religious, or, or so forth. And, and New Zealand does have a reputation for being very good at at that personal um, degree of engagement and very good at training too. Um, but ultimately, you know, is it going to be enough? And that's, I think, what everybody is asking. Um, is this actually enough? What, how does this actually contribute to, to the ultimate goals? And should we be focusing our efforts much more on, on, um, post-conflict reconstruction, et cetera, et cetera? And, uh, just looking at the world from New Zealand's perspective for a second, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with this, with this series was to highlight security issues from the perspective of our part of the world. Um, and I just wanted to end on your opinion and say, well, what sort of security issues sitting in Wellington, looking at the globe, should we really be thinking about? Well, <laughs> that's kind of it's a big sweep, actually. It is. It is I a mean, big sweep. But sometimes we need sweep. to look at global yeah. security issues and international affairs mm. issues from another part of the globe. And I think you know, there's a chance for us to do that. I agree. And I think that, I mean, there, there are some of the big ones. I mean, obviously, I mean, New Zealand has always been very, very, um, engaged internationally over debates around norms and, and, um, and so forth. So, and I think New Zealand will certainly continue to, to be so. And with a seat on the Security Council, uh, it's very much an opportunity to try to, to influence and, and to 
ensure that we keep pushing on issues like Syria, um, Middle East, those are very critical issues, which may not affect us directly, but as you know, responsible global citizens, um, as New Zealanders like to think of themselves, um, then it certainly does. More acutely, though, there, the issues around climate change, uh, we, we must, we have to think about that because that will have have security implications, right from you know, climate proofing New Zealand defence, the New Zealand Defence Force, through to climate related conflict or you know people migration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we need to think about that. The the degree of geopolitical competition that's occurring um, between China, Russia, the US, other um, uh, the other big players, that does that will increasingly encroach um, on our region yeah, um, as a consequence of what we talked about before in terms of access to resources. You know, what's going to happen over Antarctica? Um, 2048, the Antarctic Treaty is up for review. There is, you know, as technology advances, countries are more and more interested about, about mining and accessing resources in, in Antarctica. That's obviously right here in Australia and New Zealand's um, area of responsibility and, and, and interest. So, I think you know climate change is obviously one that we need to do a lot around because there are direct security implications, and that's. Um, um, but also, can you know can keep um, sort of contributing to to the debates around how we do peacekeeping better, um, and to keep pushing in, in those areas. I think is is also is very much a part of what you know both New Zealand and, and Australia can do. Um, over you know human rights etc cetera, etc cetera. i think it's it's um those are the areas where we can we can keep waving the flag and trying to have some kind of impact um but from our perspective and you know this part of the world m- most definitely resource security um climate change the geopolitical and geostrategic competitions that are going to occur as a consequence of that sure. in the coming decades Sure. And I'm sure you and I are both waiting to see what happens at COP21 in Paris later this month Absolutely Absolutely mm-hmm. And to all our viewers, if you want to read a little bit more about the implications of peacekeeping and what we've learnt, don't forget the new volume that was co-edited by Anna, United Nations Peacekeeping Challenge, The Importance of the Integrated Approach, published currently by Ashgate. Anna, I just want to thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your time. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. No worries. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.